Hello, Alex Osels, here to talk about heat and thermal conductivity, especially if you're making a drug preservation device for EK210. So your project is going along now, we're pretty far into the class, so things might be working well. You got temperature sensors working, you have a design, things are catted up, and you know heating is working well, but you're having a problem with the cooling. You just can't get it to cool. So you have a Peltier cooler, you know that if you apply the current in the right direction across the terminals, it'll pump the heat out of your device. So you might have built a box, maybe it looks something like this where you have you know, some kind of enclosure and you know, it has insulation in it. And you have uh, an insulated lid and you have a Peltier cooler sticking through that insulated lid. And you have a heat sink on both sides. because We know we, we need a lot of surface area to, to source and sink our heat. So you have two heat sinks there and maybe stuck a thermometer through the side. You're measuring your temperature on the inside and temperature on the outside. And no matter what you do, you're only getting about a delta T of about one degree Celsius. It's really not cutting it, right? Like if you can imagine if you're in your car and there's 50 degrees C out here and you want this to be say 30 degrees C, you know, max or even lower, you need to have a 20 plus degree delta from the inside to the outside. So what's going on? Why aren't these working? So the number one failure usually for thermoelectric devices like this would be mismatch between your your different layers. Like so you have your thermoelectric cooler in there. Maybe that's this red thing. And then you know a lot of the heat sinks came with a nice little sticker. You double-sided tape, you, know, you peeled off the sticker, you put the heat sink on, and then there's you know, that sticker, which is actually quite thick, you know, between the heat sink and the Peltier cooler. And that sticker appeared to be polymer. It was kind of almost like a foam tape, which doesn't seem to be a very good conductor. So I never tested it, but I'm kind of questioning if those things are good or not. And so the, uh, the you know, good thing to do would be to actually clean up the surfaces. Like the whole reason they give you that thick tape is to basically handle irregularities in your surface. Like pretend one of these was a Peltier, one was a heat sink. And you put them together and you know, they're, they're rocking on there. You know, it's not planar. And whenever you have an air gap in there, you have a severe inefficiency in heat transfer. Because we know that you know, the thermal conductivity here is much, much lower than it is in, in almost any metal, especially things like aluminum. So they provided that big sticker there. And you, know, you put it in there and that kind of took care of a lot of the ills of things not fitting. But the sticker has thickness and it also introduced its own resistance to thermal conductivity you know, just because it has a, a thickness to it. So that might be a bad thing. And then, uh, so say you took care of that problem, maybe you put some thermal paste on there, you know, you thin down that layer very much, and thermal paste should be better. So now it's you know, a very thin layer of thermal paste between the two, still not working. And then you know, the other issue could be some of the boxes that people were making had cracks in them, or maybe it was a piece of cardboard and the air was getting in, and, you know, if the air was coming in over here and getting out of there, then you have a chimney effect, you know, so your, your, your warm air from the classroom is coming in here and, and uh, heating the whole thing up, so you're just not getting a good temperature differential. So how do you solve this? So with one team, we made a big cavity in a piece of foam, so there are guaranteed to be no air leaks anywhere. We were sure no air was getting out, it had a top on it, you know, stuck a thermometer through, it was really a good airtight container, and it was still only getting about one degree C. So it seemed like one of the issues could be that the, uh, you know, you have your heat sink up here, and the heat sink was definitely cold, you, know, you put a thermometer against the heat sink and it was cold, and then there are just molecules of air in here, and then the, you know, this is made out of styrofoam, which is a very poor, conductor of heat and so it almost seems like yeah you really need a fan in here you know sitting on top of that heat sink in order to stir the air up to get the molecules to move around to get the whole thing to cool off like there just wasn't enough uh basically airflow for it to work you know it was stagnant in there so the issue with this particular fan that i had is that first of all the fan makes the cavity have to be bigger right because now Say if you added that and you really needed this whole depth right here, now all of a sudden your cavity is bigger and your whole entire device gets bigger. And that might you know, hit you up against the size constraint. So the also the other thing is that a lot of these fans are at five volts and maybe 
like 200 milliamps or 100 milliamps or something. So now you're getting a device that's going to start taking, you know, 500 milliwatts to a watt to run just the fan. And because the fan's in here and it's stirring up the air and it has electrical resistance, that whole entire watt is ending up heating up this tiny chamber. So now you have to pump out, you know, the, the watt you know, or of heat that you're producing in addition to cooling this off. Plus the fan is consuming power. You know, if this is a battery powered device, now all of a sudden we have a problem. You know, we're generating heat and we're wasting electricity. So I had an idea. Instead of having an insulating container here, maybe we could make our whole entire container thermally conductive. And then we could take out the heat sink, take out the fan, take the thermometer out now, and then I'll use a blue marker here and we'll mount the Peltier cooler on some kind of material that surrounds the whole entire pill container. And this material is very thermally conductive. So, you know, first thing I think of is aluminum. So now instead of just trying to pull heat out of molecules that are bouncing around in here of air, you know, now that the heat's gonna be moving out, you know, through all the more thermally transfer efficient piece of metal that's sitting in there. And this is a cavity, so the pill dispenser would be in this whole entire thing. You know, in reality, there would have to be some kind of removable cap so you could take it off and then your, your pills would be sitting in there. There's your pill container, a few pills. So that's the idea is to test this out. There's one other aspect of running a Peltier that we didn't really consider much, and that's how do you properly drive them? And so Professor Desai found this application report from Texas Instruments, and not to go through the whole thing, but there's an interesting sentence here, and it says, the Peltier model is driven in current mode as it is made with a PN junction. So it's a semiconducting device, and PN junction is basically a diode. It's, a, it's more accurate to drive it with a constant current than a voltage. So in class, we were always talking about driving this with a constant voltage where it might actually be better to drive it with a constant current. Let's go to the lab and see if it works. What does it take to get good thermal conduction with your Peltier cooler or here? So you need to have really, really good mating surfaces to your heat sinks. So we know that in order for these things to work well, in order for them to be able to you know, collect heat and, and uh, have a, and dissipate heat, that the the surfaces need to be like almost microscopically flat. Like this is a commercial heat sink here. And when I put it down on there, it almost forms, well, it does form a little bit of a suction. And that's what you want. And you want like a very smooth surface on the bottom to match up to the very smooth surface of the Peltier cooler. So if I look at the bottom of this piece of aluminum right here, it, it looks pretty smooth and mirrory to our eye. And it, well, it has a hole in it, but it rocks. Like the Peltier cooler is actually rocking on the bottom of there. And any gap between the Peltier cooler and the metal is going to cause a severe change in the efficiency. It's going to really decrease the efficiency. So you want to get that perfect. So in this case right here, you know, maybe there's a high spot on there somewhere. And I could try to take that down with a file. So I might file that down a bit. And then when you're filing, you know, as you're filing, you'll be able to see where the file hits. You could see it's hitting over there. And it's sitting on some of the corners, you know, so this might have, metal might have got beat up a little bit, or that's just how it came from the uh, the, the mill when they extruded it. And you keep on filing for a while, and in order for it to really work well, you keep on filing until you get a nice uniform surface, which we don't want to do in a video because you'll get bored. But filing, 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 and you can see it's starting to get better. See, we're starting to get some some file marks over there. So a few more. Probably another minute of filing. You know, if I put that in a vise and really file it nicely, we'll get it smooth. And then once you do that, there's still cuts in here. Like there's scratches from the file. And you could use different grits of sandpaper. Like maybe start with a 220 grit sandpaper. And you'd put it down on something called a surface plate. So notice I have this piece of really heavy duty acrylic right here. And you could sand it against that. And then as I do that, notice, see, it's really starting to, to clean it up quite a bit. And you can see there's some pretty fine scratches in the bottom. So when you're satisfied that you have a nice smooth surface, it's going to still be scratched by the 220 grit. So you might want to move to like a 400 grit sandpaper. 
and then do the same thing, put it down. As you go to the higher grits, you start to move in a figure eight pattern. You can see the parts being moved on the figure eight. And that helps make it smoother and flatter as opposed to just rubbing in one direction. And, you know, as I'm doing that, you can see that we're starting to take down some of those scratches from the 220 grit. And if you really want to get carried away, you can go to a 600 grit sandpaper and make this thing almost like a mirror. May or may not be necessary, but you'll know you're, whoop, you'll be in a good position when your Peltier mates nicely to the metal and there's no rocking. In other words, it really sits flat against there and has a little bit of suction. And that's really critical. Then once you get that, use a little bit of thermal paste. And the key here is just a little. If you have a nice mating surface, like you really just want the thermal paste to be filling in the micro scratches on the between the metal and the uh, ceramic. You don't want this Peltier sitting in a bed of thermal paste such that it's not actually touching the metal. So you put a very, very thin coat on. You could use something like a credit card or you know a razor blade to really paste it on extremely thin. And then you assemble your pieces and then you'll be guaranteed to get good thermal conduction. So if you're going to try an experiment, and this kind of pertains to the pill preservation device, where I'm going to make my whole cavity that holds my pill bottle. As you can imagine if I drop a pill bottle in here, just happen to have one conveniently, it's going to basically envelop the whole pill bottle. And this is conductive. This is thermally conductive. It's a nice chunk of aluminum. I actually found it in the scrap pile. We're doing an experiment. So I cleaned up the surface really well using my 600 grit. Cleaned up both sides of this aluminum plate, also a scrap metal find, and you can see they make a really nice connection. Like you can just hear that sound solid, they, they hit perfectly. Then I'm going to put in a Peltier cooler, and then one of my, my Amazon heat sinks. So I am going to sand the bottom of this, because you can see there are little nicks on the top. It's not actually perfectly flat. So before I do my assembly, I'm going to sand it. So this is going to be my system right here, and what I'm going to try to do is pump some of the heat out of the big cylinder off the top of the heat sink and I'm going to put a insulation around the outside of this. So another thing I'm going to try is that you know, the inside silver and we know you know mirror finishes don't do very well picking up infrared. So I'm going to shoot a little bit of primer in there. It would be better if it was black. It dries really quick. I'm just going to quickly sand, paint the inside of this you know, hoping that maybe it'll absorb heat better. And it's going to be a toss-up between the thermal conductivity of this and its ability to uh, you know, to absorb infrared radiation. I used some blue masking tape to protect my nice surface that I sanded before. Sprayed a little bit of primer in there, now it's flashing off. You can see it's getting kind of dull in color, which is just what we want. So now it's time to do some insulation of our cylinder. So we have our cylinder here, the paint is dry, and I managed to slit some pipe insulation in half. I didn't have the proper diameter, so I made the proper diameter out of two pieces. And I'm going to use some highly reflective tape around that as a you know, way to hold it together and also prevent the, uh, you know, provide that shiny surface that's going to have a low heat emissivity. Now I have my wrapped cylinder. It's got three quarters of an inch of foam pipe insulation, nice foil tape outside, and then I could clean the edges a little bit of the insulation with a long knife. Let's try to make that nice and flush. I'm doing that at an angle so I don't scratch up my nice surface that I made. So now I have a pretty good flush surface right there and I can slide the cylinder in and out. So I can also use that to insulate the other parts that are going to be exposed. Because the next thing that's going to go on here is this plate. Ideally I'd cut that down a little bit. I'll throw my thermoelectric cooler and then our factory heat sink. So notice I did sand the bottom of the heat sink, and sure enough, you could see right along the edges there, the uh, wherever we sanded off the black anodizing, that means there was a high spot. So that was effectively causing the Peltier cooler to stand off that heat sink a little bit and reducing its efficiency. So I made a small modification to my design, and because I'm working in a shop with only a hacksaw, I hacksawed off the corners of the aluminum plate so that it doesn't impinge into the insulation as much. So now I have less material to insulate and I'll be able to actually sink that insulation or sink that what we call stop sign, that octagon, into the insulation a little bit to insulate the cool side or the internal side of my cooling system. Get out our 
sharp knife. Make some scores in there. The insulation works better when it's not compressed. So you actually want to carve it out a little bit to dig out that insulation and have it so that this octagon sits in there. Squirt it out a little there. And cut this. This might be a better job for a small pair of scissors. Yep, definitely. It's just like a little haircut. Okay, it's a prototype once again. If we we're doing this for real, we would have had a, a drawing. Parts would have been catted up, things machined out. But here we're just proving a concept. Like the only thing I'm really looking to see here that's different from a lot of the other projects is having, you know, is having a thermally conductive cylinder, basically making the whole enclosure thermally conductive. Will that make the difference? Or we don't have to stir up the air. So now see I relieved that a little bit. I kind of dug the foam out and now my my octagon fits in there nice and flush right without squeezing stuff down. Peltier cooler sits on top. So we could put another little layer of insulation in there basically to cover the octagon and then drop our heat sink on. I found this piece of thin fiberglass insulation that I'm going to be able to use to put on top. So fiberglass isn't good for you. You definitely want to wear a mask. Okay, and we're going to pattern our fiberglass insulation out. So we'll put it down on our table. Draw a little line around it. Then we can cut that with our scissors. Let's again have my mask on. Got to work safely. I'm wearing gloves also because the fiberglass splinters get embedded in your skin. That's really itchy. Probably not good for you either. Get my disc. It's on there. Throw that extra fiberglass in the garbage right away so it doesn't get destroyed and fried and sent around. So now we have this sitting on there. So now we need to get our Peltier cooler to stick out. And here is where you'd certainly want to use a measuring device, but because we don't have one, we'll do this. We'll line it up. We'll push down on it and we could kind of feel the edge. Oops, so I could, if I'm moving in there. Okay, now I found the edge of the Peltier and I'm just kind of using my surgical scalpel to make a cut. And then I fall off the edge. Make another cut. Not sure how well this is going to work, but this is Breadboarding, proof of concept. Of course, I have wires here, so go easy on that side. So we have a square cut out, so now I'll finish cutting it out. Not on the Peltier cooler. Maybe I'll put it on the top. You can see how good my pattern is. It's not as good as I wanted it to be. Not too bad to clean this up a little bit. The 
debris out of there. So notice the Peltier cooler turned kind of like a tannish color, and that's the iron, that's the aluminum oxide, because I actually sanded the Peltier cooler as well, just to make sure there are no bumps on it. So now we have this set up here, and that makes pretty good connection. I tap on it, it sounds pretty good. And then we'll have a heat sink on the top of that. So this is my basic thermal layout, and I could flip that over. You can see we're making pretty good contact in there. There's a little bit of debris in there, see that black piece of foam? So we've got to make sure all that's clean, because as we know, if we have any imperfections in our mating surfaces, we'll lose a lot of efficiency. Okay, now it's thermal assembly time, so definitely we're going to use some thermal paste in between our, our thermal surfaces there to make sure we get good heat conduction down there. And I'm going to put just a little, very small amount. As we said before, if your surfaces are good, which is crucial, if they're really planar, try to get just a little of this out, then you definitely don't need a lot. Just putting on some dabs there. I'll smear it around a minute in a second. And it turns out single edge razor blades are great spatulas. So I'm just going to use that to kind of smooth down my thermal paste. Once again, we want it nice, nice, very thin layer. So we have a good layer on there. I'm not going to put any on the inside of the octagon. I'm just going to drop the octagon down on there, trying to line up my incisions. And it fits, it has such a nice fit that it has like a suction. I could probably lift that with that thing. Now it's time to do the cooler. So we have our, our cooler right here. Clean off some of that aluminum oxide. I'll butter up the bottom of the cooler with some of the thermal paste. Same thing, not a ton, just enough. And we'll spatula it down. Once again, I'm taking all the excess off. I'm just leaving like a very thin film on there. I have good surfaces. I'm wearing gloves now because the thermal paste just makes a mess. I want my wires on the top. So I'll do, but you know, it's probably better to put that down first because I don't want the fibers from the fiberglass to get in a nice mating surface. So I'm giving that a good push and that's driving any of the uh, the excess, the high spots that I might have put in there out. So that's down now. And then I'll feed the wires in. Put down the top insulator. And at this point I could slide the cylinder, the insulator on the cylinder up a little bit. And I'm making sure I don't have any fuzz in between the Peltier and the Top heat sink. Now we'll put the top heat sink down. Same thing. Plenty of compound on my razor blade. It's like a piece of toast, maybe a bagel. There's some baby crying in the background over a baby monitor deal with that in a sec. Prep tip pause. Okay, so we have a nice thin layer on there once again. Make sure there's no fuzz. Now our heat sink is pushed down. So the thermal system is ready to go. Okay, we're back from our baby intermission and I'm going to attach the fiberglass insulation to the cylinder insulation. A little bit of my reflective tape. 
same thing that'll improve our our insulation thermal value and it also kind of tie the whole thing together being very gentle so that I don't disrupt my heat sink and Peltier cooler just want everything to stay together pretty nicely there. extremely sticky tape it's good though because it's doing its job I'll make a little slit for the wires pass the wires through this is aluminum foil it's a little sharp it'll cut your fingers so another good reason to wear gloves put the wire around there and now we're ready for some testing See, I don't like the way that is pouncing up right there and that's probably because of the you see the heat sink is moving up so we're gonna have to have some kind of clamp on here basically to clamp this in a sandwich and the uh, I haven't figured that part out I could probably put a little bit of a weight on there to do that maybe a big chunk of metal to hold it down but anyway we can look inside we can see just a little bit on the inside edge down there there's a little bit of the thermal paste oozing out I could see it and everything is looking good so we're pretty much ready for a test right here so we just got to figure out a way to clamp that heat sink down so we get good thermal connection okay I have my my proof of concept set up here I have a thermometer it's got two thermometers on it they're called thermocouples and the top one is responding to my finger very rapidly I just touched that to my finger and it went up so we're going to put this one inside the container and then we're going to throw so this is going down deep into our aluminum cylinder we're going to put this thing full of earplugs pill container full of earplugs down in there and so I'm trying to get the thermometer I'm going to put the thermometer inside the pill plug or pill container because the outside doesn't really matter too much does it so I could do this I could stick this in here because that's really what we'd want to do right we actually want to keep the medication which in this case is just two earplugs at the proper temperature so I kind of jammed the probe in there and now I'll drop that whole thing in there push it down and for now I'm just going to use a piece of that insulation as a lid for the top instead of making a lid and then so before I do that, then we'll set up our external therm thermometer. So that was channel one, channel two is over here. So I touch it, and it kicked up. I could see it, the channel two is down on the lower panel right here. So as soon as I touch this, that went up. So confirm that they're both running. And this has a timer on it, which is kind of cool right there. So I could probably reset that. Maybe I will just reset it. So I'll turn it off. Put this at a better angle Let's see if this will actually keep it standing up okay so now we have our setup and we'll put our ambient temperature thermometer away from the heat sinks on the bottom because we don't want those to heat it up and basically change the experiment so the ambient one basically the room temperature the external temperature is far away from the whole thing so peltier cooler is hooked up to a lab power supply and I don't know which side is which. I don't know which side's the hot and which side's the cool side. So we could figure it out. I think we'll turn it on. Fire up the power supply. So we learned that Peltier coolers like to have constant current. So I'm turning it on with everything down. And I'm going to use the current knob kind of to control things here. So I'm turning up my voltage. And notice the current in red. As I turn the current knob is what's changing. The voltage is changing also, but we're controlling current. So we're in current mode operation right now, and you can see the red light is on on there. And maybe we'll just set it to one half of an amp because we have no idea what this is going to do. So it's sitting at half of an amp right now, and we have our two temperature sensors. So big number is the one inside, the little number is the one on the outside. So to figure out what side of the Peltier I have, I'm going to put the external temperature sensor against the heat sink and see if anything happens. So it looks like it's warming up a bit. So I think I got it right. So notice that my, you know, my external temperature sensor, which I'm using now just to see what's going on on my heat sink, 
is saying that, okay, the temperature is going up. The one on the inside is probably still too far away from the cooler to actually do anything or from the metal. So now I just put my ambient or room temperature temperature sensor far away again. I fanned it a little bit with my hand to cool it off. And now it's time to find a lid for our apparatus. So something that will insulate it. Hey, we're back and I found probably the best lid I could find. It's a piece of half inch thick foam insulation with a luminized side on it. They use it for housing. So I have some in my stock room. It's been outside for a little while. It's a little oxidized. But I could take that and place it on here. I'm going to have to bend my thermocouple wire down. And then I'm going to put something heavy on top of the whole thing so that it kind of clamps it all together and keeps that Peltier cooler in contact with the aluminum. Here we go, we've got a box of bolts. Everything feels pretty stable there. Okay, so we're up and running now. And we're about three minutes into our experiment. So we have a clock on here. And we're going to come back in a little while and see how it's doing. A few minutes in, a few modifications. So I added a fan to the setup. The fan's not blowing directly at the heat sink, but it's pretty close. And I'm trying to simulate a slower fan. Like that's a pretty fast fan. So I figured if I have it kind of blowing a little bit to the side, it'll get enough airflow just to keep the bottom heat sink cool, which is sitting on that piece of aluminum over there. So, and once again, we have our internal temperature is a big number, 66, external is 64.1. So the internal temperature is probably still warm because I was holding this thing for a while. So I probably heated up the whole chamber and maybe the inside of the medicine bottle that I put in there as our sample. So we'll come back in a little while, see how we're doing. The goal here obviously is to get the big number lower than the small than the small number over there because we want to see this thing refrigerate. I did have to adjust the insulation on the top to make it flush. So that way we'd get a better seal when we put our styrofoam lid on there. And I also put a little slit in the lid so that the wire from the thermocouple could come out. So that's precisely aligned. So that way we keep a nice airtight seal around our inner cavity. So before we had it on one half of an amp, so now I cranked it up to one amp, so it's at 0.99 amps, which is effectively one, so 3.4 volts, so that means we're actually putting 3.4 watts into our Peltier cooler over here. Okay, we're back to check on things. We've been running about an hour now, so voltage creeped up a little bit as expected, so the current's still at one amp, so temperature differential is a little bit better than 10 degrees Celsius right now. Take a look on the inside, do a little bit of a reality check. And indeed, it's cold in there. Touched it. Everything is cold. We have demonstrated that we can get a decent temperature differential, in this case about 10 degrees Celsius, out of this setup. So that probably doesn't meet all the criteria for the designs. But how could this be improved upon? So this was a first prototype in this situation. We make the chamber smaller perhaps could it be insulated better we have better thermal transfer on the bottom can we simply just turn up the current are we limited by our power supply is this a battery powered device so those are questions that are still outstanding and things that can be worked on but once again so this was a successful build and we did show that we can generate a temperature differential 